channel open. Welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions podcast network. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show was recorded on October the 24th, 2020, and is current through the Star Trek Discovery episode, Far From Home, so beware of spoilers. Though, given we have one Lower Deck story this week, and that show is only available in North America right now, I will be noting in the episode description the time codes for any Lower Decks discussions, so you can skip over it if you choose. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to... A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a 30-minute news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. We are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are six television shows in production, possibly more on the way, and enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole. So stick with me and I'll help you sort the real facts from a lot of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. But I can't do this alone. And my guest this week is another of my favorite returning guests. It's my good friend, Thad Haight. Thad, welcome back to Weekly Trek. I'm happy to be back. It's been at least two months. It has been at least two months. I know we've been busy, but I'm glad I managed to get you back on (laughs) while Discovery is on the air. And you know the drill by now. I want to know something that's got you feeling good about Star Trek at the moment. What's got you moving at Warp 10? (laughs) You just said it. Discovery's on the air. This week we got... I mean, the, the premiere was great. I enjoyed that. But this week we got to see the crew again and that was really exciting and I I just thought this episode was very good. Yeah, the season starts off good. I mean, I I enjoyed the premiere a lot, but this week's episode, it does feel like the show is starting to hit stride in this sort of new confidence that it has around who it is and what it's trying to be. And there were just so many great sort of moments in this episode and things about it. Like, you know, I, I really enjoy the way that Saru's character has developed over the last couple of seasons and how he's sort of come into that captaincy role. And Tilly was great. And And the, you know, sort of Western feel to it was really, really good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was very happy with this week's episode. Yes, I think it just worked very well. We had some excellent character moments with pretty much the entire crew, which was nice. Yeah, and I think we are starting to see a bit more of what Michelle Paradise, who arrived as the showrunner in time for, you know, sort of late last season, I think it was episode nine was the first episode she started out on. And, you know, I I think over those last couple episodes of the season, we had started to see more character moments for other members of the crew. And that does seem to be continuing now into season three, which is really good because I think a lot lot of people had sort of pointed to the lack of development for some of the secondary characters in the first and second seasons as maybe one of Discovery's biggest flaws. Yes. Well, the thing I am feeling good about this week is an event that actually happened today. It is the unveiling of the Captain Janeway statue in Bloomington, Indiana. So we covered this story on Weekly Trek when the Bloomington, Indiana Janeway Collective was raising money to construct the statue. And And uh, there was a bit of a pandemic delay. It was supposed to have been unveiled in May, but obviously that didn't happen because we were in the middle of lockdowns across the country. But now that that has relaxed, they did go ahead today and do the unveiling. And actually the the statue itself looks pretty good. I mean, you know, those bronze statues can often not necessarily look a lot like the person that they're representing, but I thought the Janeway likeness was not bad actually. And it's very exciting to see. It looks very good. I hope at some point to have a reason to go out to Indiana and actually see it in person. Yeah, weirdly, Bloomington, Indiana is a place I have actually been to. Uh, for some reason, <laughs> I, I I have a friend and who uh, went to Indiana University that's in Bloomington. And so we took a road trip one weekend in order to go see a, an IU basketball game. So I have been to Bloomington, but now I have a reason to go back. I have don't think I have ever actually stopped in Indiana. I've been on a train through Indiana, but I don't think I've ever actually in anywhere in Indiana. You know, it's about the same as Ohio and it's about the same as <laughs> Illinois on the other hand, quite honestly. All right, well, with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on and I'm a reporter. Shortly in advance of last week's Star Trek Discovery Season 3 premiere, The Hope Is You Part 1, still waiting on that Part 2, Star Trek franchise boss Alex Kurtzman appeared on The Hollywood Reporter's TV Top 5 podcast to talk a bit about the state of the Star Trek franchise and the impending return to production of several Star Trek shows in the age of COVID-19. 
Kurtzman talked a lot about things we've discussed at length on this show, including Discovery's third season, but his most interesting comments related to both how long Discovery might stick around and how far his plans for Star Trek extend as a whole. To the question of how long Discovery might stick around, we have subsequently learned, as we talked about last week, that the show will be returning for a fourth season, but Kurtzman indicates that season four could be quite far from the end of the show. When asked point blank about how long Discovery might stay on the air, Kurtzman responded, I'm going to say, in all honesty, there are years and years left on Discovery. I'll tell you, when the show starts to feel stale to us, we will be rallying to stop it. But for now, it doesn't feel like we are running into a shortage of stories. And how far out do Kurtzman's plans for other Star Trek shows extend? At least one Star Trek The Next Generation. Yes, Kurtzman says they have plans extending out seven years to 2027. Now, when I say that, it's not like it's set in stone, he said. It's just, here's a plan, here's what we're looking at, here's how... How the different shows are going to drop. Thad, if you could get a look at Kurtzman's seven-year plan for Star Trek through 2027, what do you think you would like it to say? Oh boy. <laughs> I'd like to see something set in the Enterprise era. Oh, interesting. Because that's one thing that, you know, there hasn't been much talk about at all. I'd like to see, like, not necessarily like a series like Discovery or Picard, but maybe a miniseries or something that takes place in that early Starfleet time. My pipe dream, which will never happen for a Star Trek series, would be if they adapted the um, novel series Star Trek Vanguard into a television sh series. That would be amazing. I don't think it'll ever happen, but that would be like my big dream. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. The Star Trek Vanguard novel series, for anybody who doesn't know, was a series of books set aboard the Vanguard space station at sort of the outer limits of Federation territory and over the course of, I think it's nine books, they basically unravel this sort of big mystery about the area of space in which they're in, and the Klingons are involved, and the Tholians are involved, and it's sort of um, it's sort of Star Trek meets Battlestar Galactica meets mm -hmm. sort of prestige television. It was very, very well done. Honestly, I think it it really would lend itself well to a TV series, the kind of TV shows that they do these days, but I, I still don't think it'll happen. Almost certainly not, but I mean, if you are looking for sort of, you know, serialized television in novel form, you really can't go wrong with Vanguard. Oh no, I highly recommend reading the books. They are all excellent. Well, I'll tell you one thing that is not on the list, and it's this persistent rumor that keeps popping up, oh, thanks to yeah. giant freaking robot, which is this whole story about the possibility of a, now that we've had a return of Sir Patrick Stewart to the role of Captain Picard, and now we ha are expecting a return of Kate Mulgrew to the the Janeway character, there have been this persistent story that's been flying around a number of the clickbait websites about the possibility of Avery Brooks returning to play Captain Sisko. And never going to happen. It's never going to happen. It's complete nonsense. I don't understand why they won't give it up. In their most recent story, they even acknowledge that Avery Brooks is almost entirely retired, has not been seen in the public eye for a number of years, and yet are still fixated on this idea that he is in discussions with CBS about the possibility of returning to Star star in a TV show, not talking about a cameo, not talking about a guest appearance, of coming back and doing a full television series again, something he has not done since the end of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. It's just, I mean, as, as much as I would like it to happen, it just is, I and mean, that is the biggest load of codswallop you've ever heard. Yeah, no, I, that's completely un, unlikely. And I keep, I do keep seeing people sharing those articles over and over again. And those stupid clickbait websites are just feeding off each other and claiming that each other's articles are proof that it's actually happening. Right. And it's like, no, you're all getting it from each other. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Avery Brooks has said, that he is done with Star Trek. He's said all he has to say that he's done. And even beyond that, he's completely retreated from public life. Yes. He used to teach at Rutgers. He doesn't teach at Rutgers anymore. He used to do conventions. He doesn't do conventions anymore. There's just no way that he is in any way, shape or form considering returning to lead a TV show at the age of... I. I think he's like 74 now. And you know, given that, he's clearly made a decision to sort of retreat from public life. I think it's theoretically possible if CBS shows up at his door with a big enough pile of money that he might do a cameo, but even that is unlikely. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So that's what we know isn't in the seven-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's going to be things like, you know, Discovery Season 5, 6, 7, 8, however many years they want to do. I mean, I don't think it'll go that long, but I think, you know... 
five, maybe six, maybe even seven, certainly sound like they're on the cards as far as Kurtzman is concerned. But beyond that, I mean, you know, obviously seasons two and three for Star Trek Picard, Star Trek Strange New Worlds is getting off the ground, these animated shows, the Section 31 show. One thing you mentioned wanting an Enterprise era show. One thing I think I would like them to do is maybe a bit more, you know, you were talking about not thinking that that's the kind of thing they would do a series for. Maybe it's the kind of thing they would do a mini series for. You know, they've done the kind of full series and they've done the sort of ultra short form content, right? The 15 minute stories. I think it would be really interesting if they did a series of of mini series, right? Where you could yes. sort of do very short two, three episode type, you know, maybe even five episode type stories where it's just sort of one and done. That feels like an area of storytelling they haven't really played with much yet. I mean, there's probably a bunch of like production reasons why it wouldn't make sense to do that because you've got to have a bunch of costumes and sets and stuff and it's just not worth it to build that stuff for only a few episodes. But the more kind of series they have, the more yeah. costumes they're making and props they're building, like they could end just like Star Trek in the 90s where they ended up with a whole warehouse full of stuff they were just constantly reusing. You could see the same thing happening here too, which would make the cost of something like that more affordable. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And I think I've been clamoring for mi Star Trek miniseries since CBS All Access started doing new Star Trek content, because I think that is a very good way, especially for us to revisit old things, because you're never going to get the cast of any of the old shows to all come together to do a new show. That's right. not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> but if you do a mini series, you can get a bunch of people, even like combining people from different shows together, and they could do also, and they could do completely different stuff too that like is not directly related to the other shows. Yeah, they could. Could, absolutely you know because they could do the enterprise era thing or they could do you know something about an entirely different ship set during the discovery time frame or during the picard mm -hmm. time frame because you've got all that stuff you know and you can just reuse it well we are still working our way through press wrap up for star trek lower decks following its first season finale a couple of weeks ago and the story i wanted to focus on this week concerns a frequent topic of discussion on this very podcast in the months leading up to the premiere of lower decks around who how and where legacy characters might appear in the show in an interview with io9's james whitbrook mike mcmahon the series creator talked at length about something he's only hinted at in previous interviews which is his philosophy and motivations behind behind the legacy character appearances we had in Lower Decks, those being the seen but not heard Chief O'Brien, Q, Captain Will Riker, and Commander Deanna Troy. In the interview, McMahon talks at length about the decision to include a Miles O'Brien call-out in Temporal Edict, saying he is, quote, the epitome of a Lower Decker, and that the character's arc in TNG and DS9 aligns thematically very well with Lower Decks itself. He also revealed the decision to show O'Brien in his TNG uniform standing at the transporter console was an homage to the popular O'Brien at Work comic strip mm -hmm. by John Adams, which is just the... And when I saw it, that's sort of what, you know, came oh, to my yeah. mind. yeah, that's what I immediately thought of when I saw that, yeah. And about those two big cameos at the end of the season, those being the appearance of Riker and Troy in the season finale, McMahon did acknowledge the similarities between their appearance in the finale of Lower Decks, No Small Parts, and the Star Trek Picard season finale, Et in Arcadia Ego Part 2, but indicated that when he found out that Riker would also be appearing in Picard to save the day in the season finale, it was too late in Lower Decks' production to make many changes. But McMahon believes there are important differences between the Lower Decks Riker appearance and the Picard appearance by Riker, notably that this is Captain Riker in his heyday and the appearance of the often mentioned but never seen USS Titan, which is still a massive thrill for me. He said it's also the Titan. It's the idea that, like this other non-Enterprise ship of a person who's moved up in rank like that, the Titan itself is such a big character in that moment. And then, of course, the style of uniform and Troy being there and that moment of everybody being rewound back in time to 2380, it does feel significantly different to Picard. Well, Thad, of those options of legacy character appearances in Lower Decks, which do you think was your favorite in season one? Oh, oh, I mean, it was Riker, of course. It was just perfect. I had a huge grin on my face for like the entire third act of No Small Parts. And 
it was it was amazing. Yeah, you. I mean, you couldn't want for better. The Riker appearance at the end of the Star Trek Picard season one finale was good, but like... Oh, it was great too. This was like the perfection of the form of if Riker's going to mm-hmm. save the day in the season finale, this is how he should do it. I mean, they just handled it so, so well. And I think since they did it in both shows, it's good that it happened in Picard first, because since it was the first time we had seen Riker in command of a Starfleet ship since, you know, the early 2000s. So it was an amazing scene to see it in Picard. I mean, it, it moved me when I when I saw that episode in Picard. I'm like, oh, yeah, and he's leaning in the chair. And it's oh, it's so good. But this, yes, this is a this is peak Riker <laughs> in the lower decks one. And I almost feel like the Picard finale would have been a slight letdown if we had seen this first. Yeah, I think that's right. It, it, in some ways, it's nice that one builds to the next. You know, you've got the Captain Riker in Picard, but then you've got, as you say, the Captain Riker in his heyday in Lower Decks. And it, it just is so, so well put together. And having the Titan 2, which of course, you know, we're both big book fans. So that's a huge thrill. Yeah, I, my only real complaint is that the executive officer is an unnamed Saurian and not Christine Vale. Yes, very true. Very true. Are there any characters that you think you'd particularly like to see in season two of Lower Decks? Now you've got a good handle on what the show itself is. I mean, pretty much any character could easily have a thing. I think it would be cool to get Armin Shimmerman in as Quark in an episode. That would be cool. I think that would fit well with the comedy and of Lower Decks. Yeah. I think I would like that too. Yeah, because I th- and I think we probably talked on a previous episode before Lower Decks premiered about legacy characters and their appearances. And it's one thing to think about which characters you want to show up when you have no idea what the show itself is. But I think you know, my ideas of the kind of characters I would like to show up are probably quite different now that I've seen the first season than it, mm-hmm. you know beforehand. So like some of the you know like I. I don't think I would ever want to see Picard show up in Lower Decks. It just doesn't feel... It just doesn't feel tonally like it matches very well. To my mind, it feels like it's got to be characters that have some inherent humour in them or humour about them that could then be applied to the sort of atmosphere of this show. Like Tom Paris probably would fit pretty well. Tom Paris would be a good choice. I mean, he needs to check up on his son at the uh, farm, so... Yeah, yeah, right. (laughs) Yes. Nathan, is that what the guy's name was? I think so. (laughs) I know uh, in... An interview, Mike McMahon, actually it was the it was a panel for Virtual Trek Con last week. Mike McMahon said that he thinks it would be cool if Bashir showed up. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, we are running a, a little low on DS9 love so far in this new era of Star Trek. Yeah, and if Bashir shows up, then I think Miles O'Brien should also show up. Just, you know. Absolutely. Give him a couple of lines this time. Mm-hmm. Well, Star Trek Prodigy has added a new member to its crew this week with the announcement that Nami Melumad will provide the music score for the show when it debuts next year. Melumad was the composer for the Short Trek Q&A released a year ago and was also the first woman to ever score an episode of Star Trek. She now becomes the first woman to be the regular composer on a Star Trek show, which is a long overdue step forward for diversity behind the camera for the Star Trek franchise. Thad, did you enjoy the music for Q&A and are you looking forward to Star Trek Prodigy? I am very much looking forward to Star Trek Prodigy. If I'm perfectly honest, I don't remember the music for q and I actually really liked it it's especially the when they were doing that was a very star trekky version of modern major general okay yeah and there were also moments in that episode i mean obviously the Michael Giacchino, who did the Kelvin Timeline movies, sort of oversaw these young sort of up and coming composers that they got to do each of the six short tracks. And I felt like Melumad did this really nice job of throwing some Kelvin Timeline homages into the music for Q&A, which you didn't really hear on any of the others, which was a nice touch since Giacchino had, you know, was sort of the supervising composer for the whole thing. We knew that one of the composers from those short tracks was going to get on us on one of the animator shows because Alex Kurtzman said a few months ago now that you know, one of the great things about the short treks had been they could try out all this new talent and one of the composers they'd found they decided to put on one of the Star Trek shows and I guess we now know who exactly that is. Yeah, that's cool. But Thad, you're a massive Voyager fan. We've not talked about mm-hmm. Kate Mulgrew coming back. This is your chance. Oh, I'm super excited. <laughs> I mean, I was obviously, I'm always excited for any new Star Trek show, regardless. But yeah, when we he- heard that Kate Mulgrew was coming back, that I am... Super excited for that. Also, I think 
this is going to give us more opportunities, much like Lower Decks, for cameos from legacy actors other than just Kate Mulgrew. I mean, certainly anybody from, you know, the Voyager backstory, right? Any of those mm-hmm. Voyager characters or crew members. I mean, I guess the open question is, you know, in what form and, and where will Janeway be appearing? I mean, it's obvious that she has a major role in the show. She was introduced as being the star of Star Trek Prodigy. And she talked about how, you know, she's getting in the scripts for each of the episodes. So it's obvious she's in each of the episodes. But, uh, you know, is she Captain Janeway and this is during Voyager? Is she Admiral Janeway and this is after Voyager gets back to the Alpha Quadrant? You know, we just don't know any of that yet. Right. Uh, I'm suspecting it's after, but yeah, we don't know for sure. Or is she a holographic version of Captain Janeway in the show set, you know, 300 years in the future? I suppose that's also possible. I hadn't considered that option. Yeah, I don't, it's what I can't get the option out of my mind. It's one I don't love because I would like it to be the actual Janeway so that it's, we're seeing advancement of that character rather than advancement of a facsimile of that character but hey it's Kate Mulgrew back in Star Trek so it's going to be great regardless. Mm -hmm. Well lastly in merchandise news the United Kingdom's Royal Mail have announced this week the release of a new line of Star Trek stamps. The Star Trek stamp collection includes each of the captains and series regulars played by British actors including for example Marina Circe's Deanna Troy Alexander Siddig's Julian Bashir and what will probably go down in history as the only time Malcolm Reed gets a stamp as played by (laughs) Star Trek Enterprise. Through the Royal Mail's online web store, that's shop.royalmail.com, you can purchase sets of the stamps, including collector's presentations and larger versions of the art for Kirk, Picard, and Spock. And the Royal Mail will ship these internationally, so you don't just have to be a British Trekkie in order to pick them up. I did order the large version of the Picard stamp, because I thought the art for that was really cool. Thad, does this give you any interest in the hobby of philately? I mean, a little. I probably will order the presentation pack that has each stamp on it because it, they do look cool. What I'm very jealous of is for my British friends to be able to actually use these because if this were a USPS stamp release, I would be buying a whole bunch of packs so that I would never need to use any other kind of stamps. Yep, we are entering the Christmas season for anybody who still does Christmas cards. It will be a, if you're a British Trekkie sending cards to your British Star Trek fan friends, it's definitely a good way of of theming your envelopes. I actually still have some of the USPS stamps that they did for the, uh, I believe for the 50th anniversary. And they're fine, but they're not nearly as cool as these. Yeah, the, the art for these is really nice. I guess Star Trek.com did an, published an interview with the artist who's some Cornish-based artist from the South southwest of the UK who had been responsible for doing them and it it is a cool twist on it too that in addition to doing the captains so you've got Kirk and Picard and Cisco and Janeway and Archer and uh, you've got Spot too and you've also got Burnham then they've got Lorca and then they've got these other kind of series regulars who were played by Brits you know mm-hmm. the three I mentioned um Shazad Latif and then they've got some movie stamps as well with the British actors from the movies like David Warner and Malcolm McDowell and Tom Hardy. It was a cool approach to it. On that topic, you know why Benedict Cumberbatch isn't on the movie stamp set? Because it seems like a glaring omission. That is a good question, especially because they just did a Sherlock series of stamps, the Royal Mail, and they included him on it. Yeah, I don't know why. That's an interesting question. I hadn't noticed that. Maybe they decided they only wanted to pay for the rights for Benedict Cumberbatch's appearance once they used it for Sherlock, <laughs> not for Star Trek. That's possible. It, it's it seems like uh because they I think they have every other major character played by a British actor in the Star Trek movies in that set. Yeah, I think they do. I mean, they and they've also got Simon Pegg from the Kelvin timeline and Idris Elba. Yeah, and uh blanking on her name, but the actress who played Carol Marcus. Alice Eve, yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, good question. I actually don't know. Yeah, that that does seem like a strange omission. I probably won't pick up those. They look kind of cool, but they're not is exciting to me if I could actually use them for real mail, I probably would. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's definitely, I'm going to be getting myself the art of the Picard stamp, and I think that'll probably be it for me. But it is, but they are very, very nice. And as you say, if if it were in Britain, I would buy a bunch of them and then never have to purchase a stamp ever again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like, uh, I got like 20 sheets of those Star Trek US stamps a couple years ago, and I'm still working my way through those. Smart move, smart move. All right, well, we've talked about the facts, and now let's speculate on what's going to happen in the future of Star Trek. You make some very good points, Captain, but it's still all speculation and theory. So each week, 
I and my guest give you a wish or theory we're nurturing about any of the shows or the future of this franchise. So Thad, let's hear your theory or wish for this week. Okay, so we could get all sorts of things happening in Star Trek in the future. We're going to see some new shows that with that seven year plan, there's got to be a, a few more new shows that no one has even considered yet outside of the secret Star Trek writing room. So I'm very interested to find out what that is. We're going to have some brand new, completely unheard of stuff. But as far as a specific prediction, I think last time I was on, I predicted that Strange New Worlds was going to start production soon, which I don't think it actually has yet. So that was a bad prediction on my part. I'm enjoying the club, Thad. The rubble of my terrible predictions behind me. <laughs> it's a wonder I even do this every week. Yeah, I also, I think I also at one point predicted that Rene Auberginois was going to be on Lower Decks. And well, that didn't work out. <laughs> well, that was not your fault. <laughs> but in this case, I guess my next prediction would be, and I'm just going to shot in the dark here. I think Scott Bakula is going to show up at some point in the next seven years. You know, that was my sort of wild prediction for Star Trek Day because they had an Enterprise panel and Bakula was on it. And I said, you know, wouldn't it be cool for them to announce some kind of Enterprise-related project and for Scott Bakula to say that he was coming back to Star Trek? We talked at length about why the Cisco thing's not going to happen. But for all the reasons the Cisco thing's not going to happen, like, I think an Archer thing maybe could, right? Scott Bakula's mm -hmm. still a working actor. He's a working actor under contract with CBS, no Exactly, less. right. He works for the studio that makes Star Trek. Now, granted, he's a regular character on a major network television show, so it's not like he's got time to do Star Trek while that's on the air. But NCIS means it's been around for a while. It's not necessarily going to go on forever. I don't know. Uh, the original NCIS is still going. Well, that's true. Yes, that is true. <laughs> but I'm sure eventually even Scott himself will decide to move on. The show may persist, but... You know, he may decide that once he reaches 10 seasons, it's time to right. hand in his badge. And he does do, you know, conventions when he can. And mm -hmm. based off of that Star Trek Day panel, he does still seem to like actually like Star Trek, which I think is an important feature for somebody to yes. ultimately want to come back again. Yeah, there are some actors that I think would never return. No, for sure. For But sure. yeah, I think we will see him in some way or another in the next seven years. I would like that to be true. And you've got now until 20. 2027 for that theory to either be confirmed or denied. So you've given yes. yourself quite the runway. There. <laughs> okay, so my wish is for CBS All Access and the Paramount Plus that will replace it to fix the presentation of Star Trek episodes that it oh, has yes. thoroughly butchered. So for those of you who watch your legacy Star Trek on CBS All Access, actually lots of people say that the streaming quality for Deep Space Nine and Voyager is actually the highest on CBS All Access. It's much better than it it's is on Netflix. It's still better on the DVD. Oh, it's nothing will beat the DVD. I mean, until, you know, they AI upscale it or remaster it, which will probably never happen. Yeah. But DVD is your best quality. But then if you're streaming, CBS will access, I think. Lots of people say is the best way to watch it. But for a number of the pilots and the series finales, CBS will access gives you those episodes as the two-part syndicated cuts and mm -hmm. not the original feature-length presentations, which I can hear you say, well, it's got an extra, you know, opening credits and closing credits. Like, what is it? matter. What matters quite a lot. It, they cut out the content. Exactly. They cut out scenes in order to fit in that extra time. So the Next Generation series premiere, Encounter at Farpoint, the finale, All Good Things, the Deep Space Nine episode, The Way of the Warrior, the finale, What You Leave Behind, Voyager's Dark Frontier, Flesh and Blood, and then the Enterprise pilot, Broken Bow, are all presented in their two-part syndicated cuts and not the feature-length premieres, the way that they're presented on the DVDs and that people originally watched them when they were on first run. And it is inconceivable to me that CBS, it's their show, and they're giving us such a shoddy presentation for some of the biggest episodes of the franchise, right? Like The Way of the Warrior, Dark Frontier, mm -hmm. All Good Things, Encounter at Farpoint, right? Like these aren't sort of small episodes and there are other errors too. Like I guess Jim Morehouse told me the other day that the episode Rise from Star Trek Voyager's third season in CBS All Access, there's an exclamation point at the end of Rise for no particular reason. <laughs> which is not the name of the episode. But, you know, that kind of silly stuff aside, which is just sort of typos here and there. That's just in the episode list, right? Right, that's just in like the episode put list. put one into the title card. No, they, they did not put one into the title card. <laughs> 
<laughs> but like, I want to watch it through CBS All Access. I'm not going to watch it through CBS All Access if they're not going to treat the shows with the respect they deserve. And you're not treating the shows with the respect they deserve by putting these syndicated cuts up and leaving them up. Like, we have told CBS several times that this is an issue they need to fix, and it's been months and they haven't bothered to fix it yet. And while they're at it, if they could add the surround sound tracks that they have on the DVDs for DS9 and Voyager, that would be great. Yeah, it's just like, come on, guys. Like, you're running this streaming service, you're about to relaunch it, and it's your show. It's not like you don't have access to all of this stuff because it's your intellectual property like you own all of this stuff just go into the archives find it and put it up on the streaming service Mm -hmm. all right that's my cbs all access rant for the episode and if they haven't fixed it in (laughs) six months i'll return to it again (laughs) do you have a theory or a wish for discovery picard lower decks or the future of the franchise that you'd like to share tweet them to me at weekly trek and i might feature your theory in a future episode well, that's all the time we've got for this episode of Weekly Trek. Thank you so much to my guest, Thad Haight, for joining me today. Thad, how can people contact you if they want to continue the conversation? The well, best place to find me is on Twitter. I'm at Tyrannicus. That's T-Y-R-A-N-I-C-U-S. And you can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me at Alexander T. Perry. And if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. And if you like our shows, please also consider becoming a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. And lastly, if you're looking for Star Trek news on the internet, I hope you will turn to trekcore.com. Well, thank you, Thad. Thank you to all of my listeners. And until next week, live long and prosper. Trek 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 Trek